a curtain drawn back to reveal the truth behind human history. The judgment of Babylon, the beast and the false prophet, and our king, slain but now triumphant, ushers in a whole new world. This is God's big picture, the perfected kingdom. In these studies, we're looking at the big picture of the Bible story. And today we've reached the last book of scripture, Revelation. We've been tracing the theme of the kingdom of God through the Bible, and we finally reached the summit, the perfected kingdom. But before we go there, let's recap on the story so far. God's promises, foreshadowed in Old Testament history and announced by the prophets, are fulfilled in Christ. He introduced the kingdom of God through his life, death and resurrection. And in the last days, he sent his church to proclaim the good news throughout the world in the power of the Spirit. By the Spirit, Christ's people have already received some of the blessings of the kingdom. But the fullness of salvation awaits his second coming, when in the new creation, the perfected kingdom, he'll put everything right. So let's look now at the book of Revelation. Revelation was written by the Apostle John, probably towards the end of the first century, at a time of great persecution for the church. It belongs to a type of literature known as apocalyptic, which uses symbolism to convey its message. Apocalypse means revelation or unveiling. God gives John a series of visions in which he draws back the curtain to reveal what's going on behind the scenes of human history. These visions are designed to strengthen believers to persevere despite their suffering. We're invited to lift up our eyes from the struggles of living for Christ in this present world and look instead at his kingdom, both present and future. So the book begins with letters from the Lord Jesus to seven churches in Asia Minor, which represent all God's people, urging them to stay faithful. Then John is shown a vision of a throne At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. What a relief that must have been for a suffering believer. At times it looks to our limited vision as if everything is out of control, but there is a throne in heaven, and it isn't empty. God is in charge. John also sees a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the centre of the throne. That's Jesus the Lamb of God who died for us. He's the divine king of the universe. He has suffered and triumphed, and his death guarantees that all those who suffer for him on earth will also triumph with him. We may not understand what he's doing in the world, but we can trust him. The elders in John's vision respond to that truth in the only appropriate way, with worship. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. If we're wise, we'll follow their example and worship the Lord Jesus here on earth, whatever the cost. The next few chapters of Revelation are dominated by a series of visions of divine judgments, seven seals, seven trumpets and seven bowls. Included within them are some of the famous characters of the book, like the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the beast. There have been many different attempts to interpret what they represent and when between the first and second coming of Christ they happen. Some have argued that the symbols refer exclusively to events at the time John was writing the book of Revelation. That's known as the preterist view. Others see the book as presenting a chronological account of the different eras from the first century to the second coming where the seals, trumpets and bowls refer to events that happen consecutively, the historicist view. Still others assert that the book only describes events that are yet to happen in the short period just before the return of Christ, the futurist view. In my opinion, each of those positions has problems. I suggest it's best to see all but the last few chapters of the book, which focus on the very end of time, as a number of sequences arranged in parallel. 
the seals, the trumpets and the bowls don't follow on from one another, they all describe the same period. Revelation isn't written to give us a time chart of history. It rather describes what we can expect in the whole of the last days between Christ's ascension and his return. So, for example, the four horsemen of the apocalypse have been active and will continue to be active throughout the last days. They represent the warmongering, economic instability and death that will mark every age until Christ returns. Christians will have to hold firmly to the vision of the throne in heaven if we're to persevere through such hardships and we'll need to remind ourselves that they will not go on forever. The last few chapters of the book take us to the very end of time when Jesus will destroy evil and establish the perfect new creation. But before that comes the final judgment. In those makeover programs on television, when a team goes in and transforms someone's home, the first part of the procedure is always destructive. The shabby furniture, the peeling wallpaper, the unfashionable kitchen units, they've all got to go. It's only once they've been taken out and piled onto the tip that the creative work begins, out with the old and then in with the new. It's the same with the world. God can't introduce the new creation until he removes all that spoils the old. Chapters 17 to 20 of Revelation use picture language to describe God doing exactly that. One by one, the forces of evil are judged and destroyed. Revelation 17 introduces us to a woman identified as Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes. She represents what the Bible refers to elsewhere as the world, non-Christian society organized without reference to God. Babylon is an obvious name for her because that was the location of the Tower of Babel, a symbol of human arrogance and pride, as well as the capital of the empire that destroyed Judah and took her inhabitants into exile. She's called a prostitute because she seduces people into unfaithfulness to live for her rather than be faithful to God. We'll certainly be tempted to do that and just fit in with everyone else. But we'd be wise to resist because she's heading for destruction. One day, a voice will cry out, Fallen! Fallen! Is Babylon the Great? God will also destroy his other arch enemies at the end of time. The beast, who represents anti-Christian powers. The false prophet, that's anti-Christian ideology. And the devil too. They're all thrown into a lake of burning sulphur where they can do no more harm. And those who continue in opposition to Christ will also be judged. Anyone whose name was not found in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This judgment is terrible, but it's also good news. Justice is done and evil is destroyed. And as a result, God's final work of salvation can now be completed. Having seen God's judgment, John is given another vision. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and earth had passed away. God is committed to the world he made. Everything has been spoilt by sin. But God isn't going to throw it away because of that. No, he's determined to restore everything, not just our souls, but our bodies too, and the whole created order. The final hope for Christians isn't going to heaven when we die. Heaven is where we're kept safe until the second coming. Our ultimate destiny is to be raised on that day to join him in the perfect new creation, with new bodies in a physical world. It will be a place in which all that spoils life on earth has been removed. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. The perfect relationships that marked God's original creation will all be restored. Human beings and the natural world will enjoy harmony once more 
will rule over the created order as God had always intended, not in opposition to God, but under him, and so nature will flourish. Revelation 22 uses imagery taken from Genesis 2 to describe a vibrant, fruitful world. A river flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Eden is restored. There's harmony too between human beings. The new creation is described as a dazzling city in which people dwell together in community, the New Jerusalem. Revelation 7 verse 9 depicts a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language. God's people will be a multiracial, multicultural society uniting those that are so often divided in this fallen world. And at the heart of everything is a perfect relationship between God and his people. The church, the bride of Christ, is united with her husband and a voice says, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And John tells us there's no temple. Of course there isn't. There's no need for one. God is everywhere and his people enjoy intimate communion with him. At last, all the promises of God are fully and finally fulfilled. The kingdom of God is made perfect, the perfected kingdom. God's people from all nations live in God's place, the new creation, under his rule and enjoying his blessing for all eternity. If we have even a tiny sense of the wonder of that glorious future, we'll join in the prayer of God's people in the penultimate verse of Revelation. Come, Lord Jesus. In the meantime, we'll need God's help to persevere in faith and obedience. So it's appropriate that the Bible ends and we'll also end our studies with these words. The grace of the Lord be with God's people. Amen. Amen.